Hello, everybody. I have officially run out of space to grow trees. And my plan is in action and set, and hopefully everything I planted and where I planted it will be great. Today on the show, I got something very special. Remember the show I did where the guy was planting five trees in one hole? Well, it really wasn't five trees in one hole, it was five trees in one circle. Well, he contacted me and said he has a new plan. He's run into some challenges with his previous experiment in, of planting over 270 trees on a half an acre. So we had to come up with a new plan. And he sent me a video from Australia. He said they're doing small hedges in Australia and they're keeping the trees really small. Now, if somebody is just starting out, that's pretty simple to do. Uh, you just keep the trees small. But his trees are big and they've gotten really big. So I wanted to go down there and, and talk to him about what his plan is and also how he's going to transform five trees in one hole or one circle and all these other over 250 trees in one half a, a, a half an acre how he's going to transfer that to small hedges so he's already got started so today on the show we're going to go there and we're going to look at what he's doing so just a quick couple of quick things here he's put a lot of thought into this and this is just an experiment for him he's doing this uh not to sell mangoes and he doesn't uh, really he's not concerned if he loses a lot of mangoes uh, because in the near future if he cuts back all his trees he might go a whole season with only a very few mangoes he might not even get any mangoes but he's not concerned with that actually he's looking forward to that because he wants to go away for his anniversary and not have to worry about managing his trees and he has several uh, situations and challenges that he's going to have because he already has an existing grove of over 250 trees uh, and they're all growing next to each other and they're getting really close. We're going to talk today in the video about some things he's done that he would have done different if he would have known about them previously, about which varieties he would have grown and not grown for his area. We're also going to look at uh, uh, some of the trees he already he already changed uh, back to uh, or, or cut back and some of the trees that he's not cutting back and why. We're going to discuss all that on today's show. But uh, uh, as I'm talking here, I'm going to show you a clip of uh, just a little bit of what he's got going on here. And uh, it's, it's pretty amazing what he's done. And his mangoes are doing great. If this is something you want to accomplish and you have the time to do it, uh, you know, he showed it was possible. But he's ready to do something else. So we're going to look around his yard and we're going to talk about uh, this project he has about uh, about switching to, to hedges. Now here's a, on the screen now, this is a video of his goal or his idea. Obviously, uh, this is what they're doing in Australia. He doesn't have acres and acres like they do, but he wants to kind of create a mini version of that in his own house, at his own yard. So let's see if this is possible and what his plan of action is to do this. Okay, so here's an example of what he has going on here now. Uh, this is an example of what I was saying here. He has uh, five, technically five different holes. It's one big circle. So we say five in one hole, this is like one big circle. It's really five in one circle, not five in one hole. Uh, but as his trees are growing up, that's five different mango trees in one hole. And as you can see how big the canopy has gotten, and there's still mangoes on there, but it's getting to a point where uh, he, do ha he has some trees with w one tree in one circle, but then here's four in one circle, and it's different everywhere. So his success has been wonderful previously, but as these trees are getting bigger, uh, the ho even the circles are getting too close to each other because uh, the trees will start growing into each other. And it also, there's some other challenges with what he's doing here. So it, it, it's a great idea and a, it was a great experiment. But now he's ready to transform everything. But just to give you an example, it's not five trees in one hole. It's five trees in one circle. There's four trees in one circle. There's one tree in a circle. There's five trees in a circle. This is an island, a big island circle here. And he has a bunch of trees. Uh, so he has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And then there's one, wait, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So 10 trees in this little circle island. And he has one in the middle. But as you can see, the canopies have gotten so big, they're all into each other. 
and the trees are just going to keep growing unless he cuts them. Now we're in a residential area. This is a another thing we're going to discuss on the video. He's doing this in a residential area, and there's a great look at his trees here. This is just in front of his house. He has a whole bunch more in the back. So what he's going to create here is a high density garden. High density uh, in terms of he already has high density, but he's going to do it in a, in a more a wiser way where he's going to cut back these trees. He's going to try to make them into hedges and transform this place. He's already started on some of the trees. He's already started to uh, uh, cut back some of the trees. We're going to discuss his plan of action of how he's going to take this amazing place with all these uh, circles and all these trees and transform it into a high density uh, slim grove garden. So stay tuned and here we go. Okay, here we are in front of his biggest tree that he has. This is a uh, Valencia pride tree. Now Valencia pride tree is known to be one of the most vigorous trees out there. This Valencia pride tree and then he also has a Van Dyke tree are the two biggest trees on his property currently. They're about 25 to 30 feet. On average, the rest of the trees on his property are about 20 feet. But things are keep, keep growing so it was time for him to change. Now, when he first started this project of planting all these trees in a small property, he, he didn't do it to make money. It wasn't for uh, a business. He did it because, number one, it was fun and exciting. And he, as he says, when he hits his, his pe head hits the pillow at nighttime, he just thinks about and dreams about uh, the mangoes and the trees and what to get and where to put them and how they're growing. And it just kept his mind sharp and keeps his mind sharp. And he loves that. And I could understand that because I love that also and uh, I just think about my trees all the time and where I'm putting them and how it's going so I share that passion with him. He also loves to help uh, or, or bring a smile to people's faces and he loves to give and share all these mangoes because he can't possibly eat them all himself and his avocados and stuff and he's even sent me a box it was such a blessing uh, but uh, this is his biggest tree here as you can see this is about 30 feet. This can grow even taller. This uh, tree is just a uh, Valencia pride tree. It's typically just a very big tree. And his other trees now that are on average 20 feet, uh, they, they run into some challenges. But uh, he was very successful with this experiment because the experiment wasn't how many mangoes he can get or to get the most mangoes. He wanted to pick his favorite varieties of mangoes, get them in the ground, and just see how they do very close together, uh, so close, like all in one circle. And uh, I would consider his experiment successful because he's accomplished his goal of growing mangoes like nobody said he can do it or he was crazy, but he was able to accomplish that. Now that the mango, the trees are more mature and bigger, he's running into uh, different situations. And again, he could stay like this and still not get a lot of mangoes. And since his goal is not to be making money or sell them commercially, that's fine. But... He's just always thinking, and it's really exciting that people are passionate about this. And he's thinking how he can help others to learn and also himself to learn something different he could do. So his new experiment is going to be cutting back all these trees. He has a plan of action to do so. And then he's going to start putting them into, into slim hedges. And we're going to talk about that today. Now this is an orange sherbet tree. This was planted about two years ago. So you can see it's, it's not... Uh, as big as his other trees are yet. The first tree he planted in the ground was in 1986. It was a Hayden tree and it's in his backyard. We're only in his front yard right now and I'm going to show you those. Uh, but this is one of the challenges that he had with this project is uh, he didn't want the trees to grow so quickly and so fast uh, and, and he wanted as much fruit as possible. But one of the challenges is he lives in a residential area and when you're living in a residential area uh, sometimes, especially when you're in an HOA or an area like that, you have to keep the lawn nice and green and you have to put sprinklers on uh, all the time to keep it green. Well, uh, watering your mango trees all the time is not the best thing because uh, they'll, they'll grow faster and they won't be as productive fruit-wise. So this is a challenge and sometimes you just got to suck it up and say, well, uh, I, I got to do what I have to do. So. Uh, that was one of the challenges he ran into. Now he does have a nice green lawn and it looks beautiful and everything's pretty here. But his trees might have grown faster and might have fruited less uh, because of that. Uh, but he, he acknowledges that 
You know, we had to comply with the laws of the local neighborhood and so on. But when you're in, a, I say this all the time, when you're in a residential area, there's certain challenges as opposed to being in a big farm or something like that. And vice versa, if you're on a big farm, you have different challenges. But here he is in this area, and this is what he's doing. This is our insurbent tree, and it's actually right next to his, uh, his Valkyrie tree. And you can see the big difference uh, in the size here. That one's like 30 feet, and this one here is like, uh, I don't know, maybe six feet. Uh, so we're going to explore more uh, about what he's done, and then we're going to talk more about uh, his plan of action, of how he's going to cut all these trees back to accomplish his new goal and exactly what his goal is. So we're going to talk about that now. Okay, here's a, one of his circles that has three trees in it. You have a Kit, a Hatcher, and a Hayden. They're literally one foot apart. So they're, they're one foot apart of these, and they're growing, and these are some pretty vigorous trees. So we're going to talk about now, I have a little paper here, I wrote this down, of why he changed his mind about doing these things. Now there's the obvious situation of these trees just keep getting bigger and bigger. It's going to start taking sunlight out of some of the other trees. Uh, and there's a lot of issues of why he's changing his mind. Uh, but basically, uh, next year is his 50th, wedding uh, his 50th wedding anniversary. And he wants to be free to go away and not have to be a slave to dealing with the trees like he's been so much in the past. So uh, he wants to kind of get control over that and not have to deal with that when he goes away. And according to him, the, 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 qu the quantity is not as important, especially he doesn't care if he gets any mangoes next year. He says, the less I get, the better off I'll be able to go away that, that particular year. So this year, after the mango season, is when he's going to put this project uh, into action. He's already started on the trees that didn't bloom yet or trees that weren't productive. He's already started on cutting those back, and we'll look at some of those. Um, but once these trees that have blooms on them fruit, he's going to cut them back. He's going to get right into it. He's going to get right into the plan. But he's doing it for several reasons. One of the reasons is that he's excited to uh, be able to go away for his 50th wedding anniversary and not be uh, like a slave to his trees and so on. So he's not in the business of selling fruit and it's not his livelihood. So it's not as important to him to miss a whole season of getting fruit or even if he gets lower fruit on, on, on every season, uh, it's not uh, going to like break, it, break it the bank because he's, that's not what he, he relies on. This to him is a hobby and a passion. And he doesn't want his passion to overtake him. He wants to have control over it so it remains fun. So that's an important thing. And it's really fun and he's really excited about the, uh, the hard work and the exercise that it's going to create for him to redo everything and just to, to change up the experiment a little because he's kind of already started with all these trees in the ground. So he's doing it to get exercise, to keep his mind sharp, to stay fun, to be free from the labor, of, uh, the intense labor of keeping, uh, taking care of these trees as they get so big and so on. And also it's an experiment to see and figure it out. So it's really exciting. So I asked Rich, that's his name, uh, uh, what he would do different if he had to do all this again. And he sent me a long list, and I felt it was important to share with the viewers in case you decide to do what he's done here. So I want to go through this list. Uh, one thing, when you look at how the trees grow and how they don't grow, the main goal of every tree grower for tropical fruit should be to get the most production with the least amount of work. Okay? So that should be the main goal. There are some things that will maybe slow down the, the, the growth of the tree but still produce the most production. But it's, uh, it's not the best idea to do things that are going to make the tree grow fast and cut down on the production. So some of the things he's learned through experience, and that's how we all learn through experience, uh, there's many different things like in our own areas, certain things might grow better than other things. So we can't just automatically take everyone's advice over the internet because they might live in a different area, they might have different circumstances, but for his circumstances and what he's doing here, he's learned some things. Now, uh, sometimes you learn a lot over the internet and you can apply it, uh, but some of the things he's learned and he would have been done different is, number one, he says, never use a weed and grass killer. Never use that at all. So that is not a wise thing to do on any fruit trees and it's a common mistake people might make, especially being in a residential area, uh, that could definitely cut down on the production and the growth of your trees. So that's something to consider. Another thing he said, something he'd do different is, uh, 
he would very rarely use a, a fertilizer uh, on mango trees that had uh, nitrogen in it with number four or higher. He would always use very little nitrogen. Now I know Richard Campbell and uh, Alex at uh, Tropical Acres and a bunch of other uh, people that grow mangoes, they don't use nitrogen at all. They're very low to no nitrogen on, on trees because what that does is it helps the tree grow up and the wood grow up and to get more wood and less fruit. And uh, that shouldn't be the goal here, at least in South Florida, uh, when you're growing your trees. So very low to no nitrogen. So another thing he said he would do is the third thing on his list he would do different or just he, he would make sure so one of the things he learned is to let the trees get starved of water when there is a drought between the end of the mango season and the beginning of flowering. At those times, he wouldn't be uh, watering his trees with his irrigation system or however he waters them. He would, he would, he's learned there's a proper time to water the mango trees and not water the mango trees for the most production. Uh, so that's another thing he would do different or, uh, or, or consider doing if you're starting out, a tip he has. Uh, number four, he says, never let the trees go over seven feet tall unless they're on the north side of the lot. So depending where you plant your tree, uh, can determine how much sun it's going to block or get. So uh, the sun coming up from the south, uh, it, it, the north being on the back side, so your trees on the back side could be longer, but if those trees are on the wrong side, they could block the this other trees. So you want to let your taller trees be in the back, So which would be the north side. So the south side, your trees are going to be uh, seven feet or below. So that's uh, something, a tip he's learned if you're going to have a good amount of trees. Now, of course, if you have a small yard and you only have one tree or two trees, uh, that's not going to be as much of a problem as if you're having a whole bunch of trees like he has here and so many trees. Another tip was uh, to prune the trees to, down to five feet at the end of each season. So knowing when to prune your trees is very important, and we talk about that on, on my channel, but... Uh, if you do that and maintain that, now some trees are vigorous growers and some trees are dwarf trees. Now, if you plant, if you have a vigorous tree, it's, it's suggested never to prune a tree more than one third if you want a good amount of fruit the next year. So if you prune the tree more than one third, it can create a problem. So if you have like a Valkyrie tree that's gonna grow a tremendous amount uh, and you cut it in half, that's going to be a problem the following year, but you can safely prune one third of a tree uh, and get away with it. But he's learned here uh, uh, to prune, or or his suggestion, and one of the things he would recommend. And again, his goal is not productivity in terms of how many mangoes he's getting, because he's not in the business of doing that. No matter what you do, you you should get some mangoes, and it should be more than sufficient for one person. But uh, he wants to keep his trees lower and. Yeah, with a high intensity gardening like this, what he's learned when you're planting them this this close to, to trim them at the end of each season really well. So his suggestion, uh, five feet at uh, five feet at the end of the season and never letting the trees go over seven feet tall uh, uh, in, in many of the areas. And another thing he's he's he would have done different or not because now he's doing it is he says. To plant the trees in a straight line about four feet apart. So this video he saw where they're talking about the slim hedges, that's what they did. They had the trees planted about uh, four feet apart, which is still pretty close. Now these trees are about one or two feet apart, or way too close, but four feet apart in a straight line. And the way you want to do it in a straight line is you want hedges and rows, according to the way they're doing things in Australia now with this high intensity slim edge gardens. Uh, now, necessarily, it won't get the most space out of your tree on each side if you do it that way, because if you crisscross your trees, instead of having straight rows, uh, you might be able to get more room for the tree to grow and have less sun blocking them on every side. But his goal here is not to do every side. His goal is to have uh, two sides open and, and slim, and then to go over and be able to pick the mangoes like a wall of mangoes on each side. And then the other two sides will be touching, the branches will be touching the previous mangoes. So one of his goals, knowing what he's knowing now in his new experiment, he would plant the trees in straight lines about four feet apart. Another thing is, uh, he would, uh, another thing is to keep the trees really short, uh, he would cut the central, the, the middle branches 
uh, to stop the vertebral growth and also to keep the airflow between the trees, which is important uh, no matter what size the tree is. Uh, for disease resistance, air flowing, and everything else, that the middle of the trees are open. So uh, that's what he would consider doing. Now, when you have tall trees going straight up, uh, sometimes the middle is the only part of the tree you can actually have because they're growing right next to another tree. And if, if, for example, if it's just one tree and you cut out the middle and you leave all everything else around the tree, for one tree, that's wonderful. But when you're having trees grow straight up because they're so close to another tree, the middle tree is where you're going to get a lot of your mangoes from, or most of your mangoes from, because they can only go out a, a certain distance if you have trees right next to them and only on one side. So, that, so that's something uh, he's learned. But he wants the light uh, to penetrate the inside, so to cut the middle of the trees uh, for fungus, diseases, and so on. Uh, this is something, before they get out of hand, he recommends. Now, another tip he says, uh, to know the varieties he has and doesn't have, and this is variety specific for his particular location, but this is important to understand and know uh, when you're planting trees to do the research. And I have, uh, in where I live in West Palm Beach, uh, I know somebody who has a lemon, uh, a lemon zest tree that doesn't, doesn't do well at all, it gets diseases, and they had to get rid of it. And I know somebody only a few miles away that has a lemon zest tree that's loaded with mangoes and doesn't really get diseases. So it's worked for him, uh, but hasn't worked for him. So even within your area, even within a couple of miles away, it could change. But here he is in Miami, a little south of Miami, and uh, south of Miami. And uh, from his experience, if he had to do things all over again, what he would do different says, where I live, two varieties haven't produced in five years. In five years. Coconut cream and peach cobbler, two of some of the best tasting, uh, most popular varieties of mangoes. Uh, from his experience, in five years, they haven't produced. Now, from what I hear about coconut cream is they do take a while to produce, but then when they produce, they produce. And I have my neighbor where I live in West Palm Beach, he has a coconut cream that didn't produce the first three or four years, and now it's producing uh, really, really well. And so... That's what I hear about that. As for the peach cobbler, I know a place in Fort Lauderdale, which is uh, about an hour north of here, maybe a half hour north of here, and they have a thriving peach cobbler. Uh, but here, uh, it hasn't produced for him. So obviously, he learned that if he had to do it all over again, he would either have to top work or, or not even plant those two varieties. When you're limited on space, you got to do these things with, with wisdom. Now, Alex at Tropical Acres always says about peach cobbler, it'd be, it would do much better out in California uh, for that climate and that environment and so on. So if you're doing some good research and looking at some of these basic tips and, 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 and information on these particular varieties, so variety is really important when you're planning out your garden, uh, you would have known that. And if you're in California, I'm going to get a peach cobbler. But if you're out here, it might not be one of the first things on your list. Now, so those are the ones that really haven't produced for with what he's been doing here. Now, he says where he lives, the best producers by far, and he names, he names a, a couple of them here, four of them particularly. He said the Sweet Tart, the Lemon Zest, the Glen, well, there's five of them, the Hayden and the Pickering. So those five have been his best producers from his experience with what he's doing here, with growing these trees close, with the way he's... Uh, fertilizing and irrigation and everything else, that's what's growing good here on his property. And he also says, if he had to choose from his 270 varieties or 270 mango trees and different varieties, 270 mango tree varieties again, he would plant uh, half of them sweet tart and, and the rest lemon zest and orange sherbet and sugarloaf. So that would be his four mangoes, uh, varieties he would plant if he had to do this all over again. He says lemon zest, sweet tart, orange sherbet, and sugarloaf. And he pretty much would skip all the others. Now why would he say something like that? And he says here because taste and production. In case he might change his mind and one day want to sell his fruit someday. For taste and production, those are the four he would keep. And he would pretty much get rid of all the rest. And uh, they're great varieties, and uh, so that's what's working here for him. Now, again, if you're watching my videos 
uh, Alex, who has a mango farm, you know, he got he is sweet tarts his favorite mango, but he ended up getting rid of uh, uh, the lemon zest because it, it had a bacterial black spot in that location. Now, Rich here in this location had no problems at all with the bacterial black spot on his lemon zest and, and hardly any of his other mangoes uh, like Alex has. And that could be for many different reasons, but environment does make a difference. But for this environment, uh, those are the four that he would keep. So he says here, uh, he would let the trees that are lined up have the adjacent trees' branches touched and trim the other two sides uh, at one yard or less from the trunk. And we spoke about this. He would have the trees really skinny and going them in hedges. And that's his goal. He's going to try to redo this place and make that happen. Now that the helicopter passed, he said uh, if he had to do it all over again, he would internalize the concept of short, small trees that is five years old because they have extremely long roots and feeding it tremendous amounts of water and nutrition as opposed to the amount of water and nutrition that he would get if the same tree was 20 to 25 feet tall. So another advantage of keeping your tree small in his experiment or his, his thoughts is they're going to get more nutrition because it's less of a tree to feed. Uh, where if you have a really super big tree, uh, it, it won't be as uh, effective or efficient as, as it would if it's a smaller tree. So that's uh, something that he's experienced. So another thing he would do differently, he says, I will not have used chemical pesticides for so many years. That's something very interesting to consider. Uh, he said if he knew how effective 98.8% mineral oil and Arm & Hammer baking soda is for killing scale and other pests, as well as fungi. So again, that's something he's learned in his own home property here, something that works better uh, or just as good as all the chemical stuff, and that's something he would have been different done different. Uh, so another thing is, and this is really great, he says, as long as I can live and learn about my hobby, I will stay super motivated to continue uh, this ex these exciting experiments and be able to fantasize about the eventual outcomes. And, uh, and that's, that's, that's the beauty and the, and the fun of doing this. We have these experiments, and my mind is always thinking about my yard because I have a small yard of what I can do, what's going to be most successful, and what's not. And again, other people have different challenges and different uh, ideas, and, 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 but it's really great. And I love that he calls it a hobby uh, or, or you know, the passion for his hobby. So another thing is where he lives, the, the, the ground is different. Where I live up in West Palm Beach, it's, it's very sandy. I could dig a hole and sand and not hit anything. It's great. I love it. Where he lives, here more down in the south, there's coral under the ground. So to dig a hole is a lot more work. And, and he says uh, he's addicted to digging a hole through the coral rock because he hates the gym and he hates exercising inside the gym. But he loves working hard and getting into the, uh, the, the, the rock and digging. And he gets sad when he has dug all his holes and he has no more holes to dig. Uh, so uh, he, he likes uh, finding ways to get his exercise in naturally, and this he finds a way to do it. Another thing he says, if he didn't have problems and challenges to overcome mentally, it wouldn't be fun anymore. So if he did it and everything was perfect and everything was working out great, it wouldn't be as exciting as, well, this happened here, this, this, this tree is growing into this tree, this disease is happening, or this weather and considering the hurricane, all these different elements, that's what makes it really fun and exciting and to keep going. And, uh, and some people consider it a nuisance or a pain when you're having these issues, but that's what motivates him, is to solve it and to overcome these, these things. So it's really wonderful. Uh, and another passion he has is he loves sending, he says here, a 30 box of mangoes and avocados to friends and families throughout the United States and how happy they get. And he, he especially loves when he, he gives mangoes to his, to his children and his grandchildren and to see their expressions on their face. Uh, when they can get these amazing mangoes uh, so far and uh, so far away and it's so cool so uh, he also discusses the different times you pick the mangoes some mangoes can be picked on a tree when they're ripe some mangoes don't do good when they're ripe so you got to pick them at certain times and learning about that learning about which varieties to pick when uh, makes a big difference 
And uh, so as you watch these videos, that's what we try to uh, teach you. So he's learned that uh, the cherry mango and the orange essence mango, uh, they, they're, they're terrible. They taste terrible if you pick them when they're ripe. So those are mangoes you want to pick when they're not ripe. Uh, so those are just some examples of the things he's learned. Uh, so it takes many years to figure out which varieties can ripen on a tree and which one's not. Uh, and uh, as we're going to discuss his plan about keeping the trees short, another advantage of that is when the winds come and if there's a hurricane or something else, if the trees are short, there's a better chance they're going to survive. So that's what uh, he's motivated about also. So transforming this amazing place with what he's learned and what he would do different to what he's discovering now in his new experiment, he has a plan of action how he's going to make that happen. And now we're going to go look closely and see what he's already started doing and what his plan is. Before we go to the next area, I just want to show you this circle that I was just standing in front of. And then we see the four trees, how close they are together. So that's like two feet apart from each other and not even. And there's his Kent, his Hayden, and his hatchet tree here. <laughs> and uh, there you go. So that's the tree we're standing right in front of here. And, uh, and it, like I said, they, they, they're getting mangoes, and they've always been getting mangoes. But let me pan out here and go a little farther back and give you a nice view of all his trees from the side. Now, this is the side of his house. So you see over there, there's two single ones right there in the front. Then there's this hole here with five trees, and he dates them, and he... He has this one's a lemon zest right here at the end here. And he has all his trees labeled as a pineapple pleasure. But you see his circles, even though he has one tree there and five here, his circles are starting to, the trees are starting to grow into each other. But that's okay. That's okay for, for the reasons we discussed. If that's your goal, that's fine. So I'm going to come out here real quick here. And take another look at this before we see how everything else is going to be changed soon. That's the front of his house here. And then we'll go later to the side of his house. And we'll see how it's going to look. And he does this so we could all learn from our own, from his experience, things that he would do different. So maybe if we decided to do something like this, we'll have second thoughts and, and just learn from his lessons. All right, now we're going to see his plan for action. Of, of, of what he plans to do to this to these trees next year. All right, here I am in front of his five in a hole avocado tree, uh, avocado trees, or five in a circle, <laughs> not in a hole, in, in a circle, and absolutely looks amazing. And I want to talk, because not only is he going to redo his, his mangoes, but he's also going to redo his avocados as well to keep them shorter. And we're going to discuss this and show you a little about what he's doing uh, in his plan of action but first, I want to actually tell you what his plan of action is, because it's one thing to decide to start growing hedges or growing high-intensity uh, gardens with the small trees that are really bushes, but it's a whole other thing to have trees that are successfully grown already and redo them. Uh, so his plan of action is uh, uh, when each tree this season has uh, had its fruits picked, or when each tree that is not produced yet this year has given a signal it's ready to be remodeled, be remodeled. That's when he's going to start the process of redoing these things. So he's already cut 50 young trees back. And uh, there's not much to see on those trees. But there is something to see because we're going to see how he's cut them back. So of the over 200 trees he has, he's already cut back 50 of them. So he's getting started on this project already. Uh, but he has to wait on the other ones. Uh, till they fruit or he's choosing to wait till the other ones until they give fruit this year uh, Before he cuts those back. So it's not something that he could just do automatically and start immediately on everything He's actually going to be going away for a couple of months So while he's here he wants to cut back what he can come back and see what's fruiting and then cut back the rest and, and, and just put this uh, experiment into effect so the trees of the 50 trees that are his newer trees that he cut back already, he cut them back uh, to around 5 feet or around that, and that's where he plans on ultimately keeping them. So, uh, But his bigger trees, 
uh, that's another question we're going to talk about because if he doesn't cut them back enough uh, when they grow new shoots, those shoots are going to be more than what he actually wants to accomplish. So ultimately, if you're doing this from the beginning, you want your trees to be really short and growing out uh, their, their branches really low. So when you cut them back, you're continuously cutting it low. But in starting this project, if the, if the branches are coming out this high, now you have a little issue and a little thing to consider. Uh, so so uh, he's already cut down those 50. And so these are challenges he's going to figure out and he's going to overcome. And I'm excited to get back here and see his experiment uh, when, when he gets through this. Uh, so the other trees, he's going to wait till the end of the season before he finally cuts them back. Uh, the same thing uh, with his avocados and his mangoes. And here's some more of his plan of action that he, that he sent me here. He said, trees that only recently put out leaves instead of flowers uh, are the ones that are going to get cut. So if there's no flowers or blooms, he's cutting those trees, no matter how tall or long they've been in the ground. Uh, trees that have fruits on them are off limits. He's not going to touch those trees. If a tree is next to a tree that has fruit on it, uh, he's not going to cut them back because he doesn't want the tree that he cuts when it falls to knock down any of the fruit on the existing trees. So that's something really well to consider. I once had a big mango tree with grafts at the bottom and I cut down the branch on top and they fell and took them right off. Uh, the ones that were already there. So that's a very wise thing to do. So even if the tree doesn't have fruit, he's going to wait if a tree next to it has fruit because these trees are so close together and he doesn't want that uh, to become an issue. So here we are now, we're at the end of March, and he says if a tree has buds and can possibly put out a flower, uh, he's going to not cut those branches off just yet. But if the tree has no buds uh, and, and has no leaves, those he's going to be cutting off. He's going to actually wait to see which trees are promising to give blooms or flowers and which trees aren't before he makes his final decision on what he's going to cut sooner or cut later. Uh, and we've got about a week left before he decides his final number of what he's cutting. But he's already cut uh, 50 trees, uh, and that's its goal. So he wants to ultimately cut most of them uh, uh, and keep that, keep the trees around five feet tall, ultimately. Uh, but that produces or creates uh, another thing that he has to strategically think about because it's easy if you're doing this from the easier if you're doing this from the beginning where you're just growing them and you can stop them at that level. But when the trees are this tall, if you cut the wood up a tree like this, uh, when the greens go out, they're going to grow much higher. So ultimately, you want to either keep if you're doing this from the beginning or start this new. You want to cut the wood small so the branches that grow out, you can start uh, managing the branches so they don't go over to your intended uh, length and height. Uh, so most of the trees are already cut back uh, to five feet or so, the ones that he's cut. And the ones that he hasn't cut, he has to make a decision how far back he wants to cut them. Ultimately, according to the video, and I think I said his five feet that he wants to ultimately keep the trees. No, that's what he wants to ultimately cut them to. But I think his goal is seven feet uh, of where he wants to ultimately keep them and not look at, get any higher than that. Uh, and of course, you know, it's not to the exact amount. It might be a little taller. It might be a little shorter. But his goal and why he's doing this uh, to have more, ultimately more food production because you're going to get more sun and also uh, just just so many advantages to doing this uh, but then finally he's also going to have easier time picking the fruit and even though he likes the exercise of picking the fruit and working with all this when you have this many trees it's enough exercise even if it's easier to do uh, so those are, are, are things he can uh, consider so some of the things he has to wait until he cuts back uh, so he's looking at the leaves on the tree and 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 just from his experience and what he's seen over the years of what's producing and what's not producing to decide what he wants to do in terms of uh, of what he's going to cut now and what he's going to wait uh, to flower and see what happens. Now, uh, in the video, as you uh, as you can see with the link below the video, the way they're doing it in Australia, he might not be able to do it exactly that way here, but that's what his goal is and he his idea is. And uh, he has the exact amount that he wants to trim the trees on the side and how wide he wants to make them. Uh, and ultimately, he wants to uh, have them at that certain length. And he also wants to uh, trim out the middle to allow the, uh, uh, the most sunlight and so on. So 
let's now take a look at the possible issues. First, I'm going to show you a little bit closer this uh, mango, uh, this avocado circle, not hole, but circle. And then we're going to look at some of the possible issues that, that can happen or things he has to overcome of these challenges of this project. Okay, let's take a closer look at his uh, five in one circle avocado tree. <laughs> Often said by accident, five in one hole. As you see, it's not just one hole, it's five separate holes, but in one circle. So he has a Haas Carmen variety here. This is a, a really nice uh, avocado. Uh, not that many people have this variety, but they should. It's really nice. Uh, and then he has here uh, this one, which is a VC801. VC801. I don't know how anyone else that has this variety, uh, but this variety does great for him. He loves this variety here. And then uh, the middle tree is a Monroe tree. And then he has a Miguel tree. And then he has a Catalina tree. Five in one hole. And they're all flowering. It looks like it's going to be great. And this very tall, but he's going to redo this, this whole thing. So it, it's, uh, he's going to miss it, I'm sure, of his experiment. But I'm glad we got it on video here for him. And now we're going to go look at some of the potential issues or challenges he's going to run into by redoing this experiment and project. Okay, here I am in front of this uh, lemon meringue tree, which is one of my favorite varieties. I have two of these trees. And this is, he's already got it started with this project. He's cut this tree back and uh, he might even have to cut it back some more because so this is one of the challenges when you when you're starting a, a, a something that's already been started. So if you were starting from the beginning when it's this low and like over here you can keep the main trunks at this level. But since it's already grown, you don't want to cut it back too much because you want to make sure it's going to grow back. So this is a project that might not happen uh, in one season. You might have to make sure this grows and then slowly but surely keep cutting it back. Uh, so that's one of the challenges we could foresee. But this is his ultimate goal right here, is uh, all his trees, which are uh, pretty much fully grown now and pretty big, he wants to cut back and then uh, reshape them or regrow them. Uh, a lot of his trees are already in a straight line, so he can do these type of hedges. Uh, so uh, it's, it's disheartening to see a beautiful tree cut back to this. But I myself have cut, had to cut back some trees like this, whether you're top working or, or for what other reason, moving them. And they do grow back. Mango trees are pretty good. Uh, avocado trees are pretty good. Uh, so if he was doing this with other trees, I'd be more concerned uh, or doubtful that it could work. But I know with mangoes and avocados, this can be accomplished and this could work. So I want to show you some more issues here. If we come over here. This is one of his uh, five trees in one circle. And, and so we, there's two things I want to discuss here. Uh, so he's not sure with his tree in the middle how he's going to actually be able to get them uh, according to the hedges and how he needs to do it. So this is something he's going to have to experiment and figure out. Uh, he might uh, have to find, he might have to eliminate the middle tree in each circle and just have the four. It's something he will figure out, uh, but uh, this is something he's been doing. One of the things he was mentioning is he's going to try to keep the trees in the middle straight up, going straight up and, and very thin. So the sunlight, from the, uh, it won't block any sunlight from the outer trees. So as these trees are going straight up, uh, and he could let them grow much higher where he'll leave the other ones at the desired height. So he might leave the middle one still and if he can accomplish that goal, that's wonderful. If he can't accomplish that, he might uh, have to eliminate it or just keep it very low so the outer ones can grow. But that's something he's going to figure out. Uh, and he has a lot of uh, room to play with. He could try maybe two different things on, on two different ones. Here's a great example of a hole uh, or a circle he already cut. He already cut everything here. So it looks like he cut all of these different varieties on the outside. A great example of, of what he's experimenting with. So these are all much shorter now, but the middle one he left taller. So the sunlight is not going to be blocked from these because he's going to keep this one skinny. He's not going to let it get uh, too, too, too big, the canopy. So it won't block these. Because normally if he didn't touch it and his canopy uh, overgrew these, these trees wouldn't produce at all because they would just be completely blocked by sun. 
So his goal here, or his experiment, he's going to try keeping the middle tree and saving it, but just keeping it as skinny as possible and letting it grow taller, and the outer ones will grow shorter. Now come over here. Let me show you this here. In this tree. This is very interesting. This is a cotton candy tree that's been grafted onto a dwarf Hawaiian stock. Uh, so it was once dwarf Hawaiian, and he put a bunch of different shoots on this, and now it's cotton candy. However, the shoots he put on were pretty high up, and he doesn't want his trees to be that high. He wants them to be lower. But if he cuts these lower, he's going to lose all those grafts. But as he said, the worst thing that could happen is he's just going to have dwarf Hawaiian again come back out of the, the rootstock. So it's not going to be that bad of a deal. Uh, mm -hmm. If he does lose the cotton candy, because he'll still have the dwarf Hawaiian. Mm -hmm. Now, if he was doing that from a seedling tree, that would be another problem because he doesn't know what the rootstock is. Uh, but the dwarf Hawaiian was grafted way low, so even if he cuts these below his cotton candy grafts, he's still going to get dwarf Hawaiian. So, as long as he didn't do it from the seedling tree, that shouldn't be an issue. Uh, but this is why it's important to be aware of what you planted and where in your different grafts. Uh, and he was excited to do what he did when he did it, but he might change his mind in the future. So if he does, it's good to have a good record and, and keep track of everything. That's why I like uh, that he has everything dated and he also has everything named. And, and he's aware of these things. Uh, if you have too many trees, it might be more difficult to keep uh, track of these. So it's good to document these. So these are just some of the challenges and possible issues uh, that you can see. Now another possible issue is, or not an issue, but in terms of the timing of doing these things, when you're cutting these branches, it creates a lot of debris. And when you're living in a residential area, it's not so simple to just get rid of these, uh, these trees and you just can't put them all out in front of your house. You have to do it uh, in a certain timing, in a certain way. And he has a whole bunch, I'll show you, of of uh well, well let me show you his cure what he did of how he's going to get rid of a lot of these uh, a lot of this debris you see in my neighborhood it's a little different you just put the debris in front of the house you have to only have a certain amount uh as well but here i'll show you how, how he's going to tackle this challenge all right he has six of these recycled garbage bins one two three four five six now he has seven of these recycled garbage bins, and he's filling up all of them with the debris. So he can't just leave them out in his yard in his residential area. So he has to only prune his trees according to how many of these he can fill up. For him, that's a problem because if the tree's ready to be cut, he wants to cut it. And he's excited to get started with his project. He doesn't want to have uh, this issue. So, uh, but that's the way. He, Thankfully, he has all of these uh, garbage, uh, all of these garbage containers, so he can put the debris in, the debris in there, the debris in there. But eventually, uh, it's going to slow down his process unless he figures something else out. So that's one of the uh, possible challenges. He definitely has his challenge cut out for him. Another challenge is on the video in Australia when they were doing this. Uh, Alex at uh, Tropical Acres Farm says a lot of those videos in India and Thailand and. Australia, where they're doing the high-intensity, low-growing uh, hedges, they're using plant growth regulators. And what that does is it pretty much takes a vigorous tree and makes it almost like into a, a grow like a dwarf tree. And uh, that seems like that's great for them, and they're able to accomplish that. But the problem is it's illegal in the United States to use certain uh, chemicals that are used in these plant growth regulators. So we can't do that here. So... Uh, Alex at Tropical League has said uh, something like this can work possibly with dwarf trees like Pickering or maybe dwarf Hawaiian and dwarf trees. But if you're going to get into the vigorous trees like he has, it's highly unlikely that he'll be able to do that uh, successfully and get a good amount of mangoes on his trees. However, Richard's very aware of that, but that's not his goal. His goal isn't, it's not a commercial orchard. It's not his goal to get a massive amount of mangoes. His goal is to have, uh, uh, or one of his goals is to have a, a beautiful, neat looking yard with producing mango trees that he could share with his friends and he could still maintain this passion and to create enough work where he's getting exercise, but not so much work where he's overwhelmed and stressed. And so it's a, it's a possible goal because, you know, remember, he can keep all of these trees small. The issue is 
uh, will they produce? And uh, some of the trees that are vigorous trees, if you cut them back, they might not produce well at all. Some of them might not produce at all. But there's only one way to find out. And I know myself, I know somebody who lives locally that has a mango tree. And this mango tree is truly a bush. I mean, the tree is up to here on me. And it's not growing. The, the, I don't know how much they prune it, but the tree's up to here. And it has about, uh, when I go back there, between 10 to 15 mangoes on it every year. That's sufficient for the, for, for the person that lives there. Uh, it's a small apartment complex. That's what she wants. She got her, she got her uh, 10 to 15 mangoes a year on her little bush. And so be it. You know, so that works for her. Now, 15 mangoes in a bush doesn't seem like a lot. And if he cuts these all back to bush size heights, 15 mangoes on a tree where he can get hundreds from a full grown tree seems like a big difference. But when you have 277 trees and you have 15 to 20 mangoes on 200 trees, that's more than enough uh, for, for him and his friends. And so uh, I'm excited about his project and we're definitely gonna come back here and get an update and, and, and see what's going on and what's growing on with it. But, Here's just an example. These trees are in a straight line. And I'm excited about this because he's going to be able to make a, a nice head. Most of those are in a single circle. He has a couple here. This is three in one circle, and that's five in one circle. But then going down the side of his house, they're all, uh, they're all one in a circle. So he's pretty much already started something like this out. So it's, it's, going, to be, it's going to be great, and his goal can be accomplished. Now, when we look at his goal... Uh, we're going to look at what his goal is actually actually is. And he says next year as he's doing this, he's probably going to get a fewer mangoes than he's ever had because he's going to be cutting everything back after the fruit season this year, and he's already started on some of them. But ultimately, uh, his goal is going to give uh, him an opportunity to pick the mangoes much easier, uh, to not uh, have as much money and time wasted on fertilizing and spraying the trees because if the trees are smaller, there's a lot less of both of those involved. Uh, the pruning of them will be easier when they're lower. Uh, there's so many other advantages to this, uh, to this, and uh, the better control of the fungus and the pest when it's lower, and ultimately it's going to lead to cleaner fruits. And one of my favorite uh, advantages of doing something like this is if a hurricane comes or strong winds, when you have a big tree, you're in a lot of danger. But when it comes to something like this, there's very little danger if the trees are much smaller. So that's a big, big uh, advantage of doing something like this. So uh, smaller trees also mean uh, that the, you'll be able to get more nutrition to the trees in a more efficient way because there's not as much uh, uh, tree to to supply the nutrients too. So you give the same amount of nutrients or a little bit less and the tree's actually getting more and using more. You'll be able to be able to properly manage the trees from a better standpoint uh, and control them better when they're, when they're younger. And also finally, or when they're smaller. And finally, here we are in a residential area. And to have big beautiful trees is wonderful. But it's definitely uh, uh, an eyesore if the trees get too big or too out of control. And it's easier to keep the trees under control when they're smaller. And that's another uh, accomplished goal that he has here, is to just make it more, uh, more uh, uh, pleasing to the neighborhood, so to say. Uh, so, uh, and then, of course, the more sunlight penetrating it and, and, and just, uh, the trees and just so many advantages of why he wants to do this experiment. Uh, so... The thing I find very interesting and, 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 and almost comical about what he's doing here is he doesn't eat the mangoes. I mean, he's tasted every mango he has here and he's selected his favorite ones, but he has such a heart uh, to share the mangoes with other people. Uh, and But he doesn't really eat them. He shares most of them. He sent me a box last year. He sent his friends a box. If you're watching this video, uh, he's not going to be sending everybody a box of mangoes, but he doesn't sell his mangoes. He sends them to his friends and his families and, and his family. And uh, so he gets joy out of that. And that's a beautiful thing uh, about him and about what he's doing here. And obviously he could have a nice clean lawn, no trees, no hassle, no fuss. And, but he doesn't want that. He wants to, you know, get the exercise. He wants to have his mind 
always thinking. He wants to experiment, learn new things, and he also wants to share with other people. What more can you ask for? That's just a, 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 a genuine, generous, humble person, and that's a beautiful thing that he's doing. And uh, But I, I love that he did this experiment to see how many trees can grow in one area, and I'm going to uh, take a list around and show you more uh, uh, about this. And for me, my garden and my yard is just starting out. Uh, I got some bigger trees, but for the most part, I trim my trees every year. And uh, Richard Campbell has uh, this high-intensity garden idea, which he keeps his trees nine feet apart each. And I interviewed somebody named Barbie, uh, Bobby on my channel, who, who actually has a whole grove of mangoes that he's doing like, uh, like that as well. But starting from the beginning, so he doesn't have the same exact challenges Richard here has in cutting things back and so on. Uh, but he's growing them up and he's going to see how they'll do. And the best thing to do in garden is to experiment. That's how we learn and that's how we grow, right? Uh, so, uh, pardon the pun, that's how we grow. So, I want to take a look now uh, at his garden here and his trees. And I want to just show you of what he's already got started with, of what he's doing. I'm going to get behind the camera and, and run around and show you what he's doing here. But uh, basically, to give you an idea of what he has now and what he's accomplished here, he has... Uh, as he said, over 270 trees, and of them, on lemon zest, he has 45 lemon zest and 45 uh, sweet tart uh, trees. He has 35, uh, no, 26 orange sherbets, 26 cotton candy, 14 lemon meringue, 12 sugar loaves and 12 cappies, 12 pineapple pledges, 8 M4, 5 orange essence, 2 pickering, 6 buttercream, five fruit punch, four peach cobbler, four coconut cream, four pina colada, four kit, three phoenix, two venus, two juicy peach, two hatcher, two hayden, one spirit of 76, two rosy gold, one harvest moon, one van dyke, a one valencia pride, one duncan, one seacrest, two glen, one kerry, and, uh, and then on his avocados, he has a VC801, he has four of them, he has three Catalina, he has a Samuel 34, he has one of those, he has two Miguel's, two Lulu's, one Pollock, one Simmons, one Monroe, uh, two uh, Malima Haas, he has a Wilson uh, Proponi, he has one of those, he has one Donnie and one Choquette, one Oro Negro, one Nishikawa, and one Marcus Pumpkin. And uh, this is what he's created here. So now I just want to... Uh, just give you an idea of what he's done and I'll put a link to the previous video that I did on this so you can get a better idea of, of what was growing and how much things have grown in over a year. It's pretty amazing. So I'm going to go around now and just show you some of these uh, things he has. He also has a le uh, two leachy trees on the property and uh, but that's it mostly. He doesn't have a big variety of different fruits. It's mostly mangoes and avocados. He has some leachies and I think a long in. And uh, we're going to take a look at what he's got growing on here now. Right. So here I am in front of his uh, house here. And I just want to walk you through this and just show you here. Here's a, one tree where you can tell, even though it has mangoes on the tree, he already started cutting some of these uh, branches that didn't have uh, fruit on them. But as we looked earlier, look, look at that. Five trees in one circle. Absolutely amazing and if you only have a small space and you want different varieties There's two ways to do it one way is to have one tree and have a bunch of multi grafts They call that a cocktail tree or you could do this You can get a little circle area and you can plant a bunch of trees in one area and they will grow and he's done it successfully And look there's still mangoes up there and he's done it and here are some of his newer trees in the front he Never given up even though he had all those he wanted more to fit as many as possible here there's his island in the middle. And here's some more trees right in the front. We discussed last time the possible challenge of uh, people coming here and taking them, uh, but it's not too much of an issue in this neighborhood he lives in. There's the avocado tree we were under. There's five trees in that avocado tree. And some more mango trees right on his, his road. and. Uh, and then here is the hole we were at where he's already started cutting. You see the tall one in the front and then the smaller ones there. Then we come around here to the side. Bunch of mango trees on here. 
coming around. So these, he's not cutting yet because they look like they're possibly going to give the blooms. And there's the garbage. Now, even if he wasn't doing this experiment, he'd still have to prune his trees tremendously. And he'd still have this situation with the garbage cans. He'd still have to prune them and prune them a lot. So we're coming to the side now. I just want to give you this view here. So that's uh, his lychee tree, one of his lychee trees. And then here's the side of his property here. Just goes on and on and on and on. It's just a, just amazing. So he's already kind of doing this almost to a degree, but it's going to be a little bit, a little bit different. But you see his trees, they have a good amount of mangoes on them. And it's not just one row, it's we come in here. So these are a single trees, and even though they're a single tree, they're still really close. I mean, I don't have a measurement with me, but that's probably four feet apart, those trees. And it looks like he started cutting some of them back already. And it just goes down to the end there. Okay, there's another hole with five trees in one hole and so that's just this side of the tree and then the side we started on I showed you earlier and let's go look a little closer to his house here and this was really interesting so I remember when he planted this tree this is just a planter that's in the side of the house that most people would put a garden in or plants he put a tree in it. <laughs> he put a tree in there. And uh, why not, right? He put three trees in there, actually. And it looked like they're doing good. Some of them have room to grow over his house. Probably some of the best trees he's done. So that's, that's a great idea there. And as we come around here, all his trees are dated of when he put them in the ground. And that's the other side of his property here the other side of his property. A lot of these trees are in uh, a one in a circle on this side, but they're still close together, the circles. And then we come here, and this is all only his front yard, folks. We haven't even seen the back, I'm gonna get there now. All right, now we're going to the back of his property. Uh, before we do that, I know some of you are wondering how big this is. It's a one half acre, a half an acre corner lot, <laughs> and he's fit all these trees. There's another lychee. Look at this. Absolutely amazing. Absolutely is amazing. His uh his yard here. And then he has a pool here. Absolutely amazing. We come closer to the fence. You see he already cut this sugar loaf back. So some of them he's cutting back. Here's all sugar loaves. But look, so we had this here, and then he just put another lemon meringue right there. A lemon zest. All lemon zest back there. So he's got his work cut out for him, but he's gonna do it. This is his backyard. This is beautiful. This is beautiful. So as he says, he's got to do this strategically, but a lot of all of this is already in a hedge. And he's going to figure it out. I just love walking in his yard. <laughs> and it's possible to do this. He's been doing it. It's possible, but you know, as you get older, pruning these and picking mangoes from these, as these trees get bigger, is not as easy. <laughs> But a lot of stuff has grown in the last year since I've been here. A lot of stuff has grown. But he's going to get all this cleaned up for his new experiment. See here we have some trees he's already started with. Looks like they're growing back. He And he doesn't have he has some top work trees, but they're not all top work, so he doesn't have that problem too often. But he's just he's 
just want to show you all uh, all of what he's got growing on here. And then over his pool. Okay. All right, everybody. That was our tour about this uh, amazing house and this amazing experiment that's about to happen. And we're going to come back during and after and see how the process is going. And I'm so excited about uh, what's growing on here because some of you, for your situation, this is going to help you learn a lot about what to do and how to do it. Again, you can accomplish anything, but you have to experiment for your area, for where you are, what's growing and what's not. Do the research, find out, but actually apply it to yourself and your own land as well and find out what works best. Thank you so much for watching. Put your comments or questions below. Please like and subscribe to this video. And I'm also going to put a link below this video to the last video I did while I was at this house and also to the video that inspired Rich to take on this new experiment. I'll put them both below the video. Thank you, everybody, for watching. Have a great day and keep growing.